Now we come to the second video in my summary of Berger's uh, third chapter in his heretical imperative, which I've entitled Neo-Orthodoxy Neo and its Critique. So Berger's book is from 1979. Uh, it's subtitled Contemporary Possibilities of Religious Affirmation. And as you remember, he says there are three uh, possibilities in the situation of pluralization. So we've already talked about the case of Protestant neo-orthodoxy in the first video in this chapter, and now I'll move on to the second and third sections, a flake-like thing on the face of the wilderness and critique of leaping. Um, so let's begin. Barth's entire work is dominated by an overwhelming sense of confrontation with the word of God. The Christian God speaks, and the only adequate response by people is to listen in obedience. Spoken by the prophets and witnesses of the past, the word of God is now found in scripture and the preaching of the church. Any specifically Christian thought, such as theology, must begin with the Word of God. No external criteria can be considered, for example, no philosophy, no science. The only criteria for studying the Word of God is the Word of God itself. It is a gift of God. Theological reflection is an act of faith in obedience to God's call. It is not based on human decision but on divine grace. Liberal attempts to find avenues of approach to the word of God are doomed to fail. There is no way from man to God other than to follow what God has already said. Man can only know about God what God has revealed about himself. All the theologian can do is to clarify the content of God's revelation. Only those who hear the word of God in the church know its reality. A historian or other observer can ask how the individual has such an experience, but that doesn't reveal anything about the word of God as such. All modern thought since Descartes and all Protestant liberalism since Schumacher is in error in thinking that there was some innate human capacity to experience the divine. There is no such capacity. Only the word of God itself gives the capacity to affirm it. The liberal approach to religious experience is rejected. The only way of experiencing the Word of God is through the Word of God. Every human response to the Word of God is by His grace, so cannot be rooted in any anthropologically given quality such as will, conscience, emotionality or reason. There are no avenues to faith, only faith itself, but this is only through God's grace as the flakes of manna which God gave the Israelites in the wilderness. God reveals himself in specific events, notably in his self-revelation in Jesus Christ as the eternal word. Jesus Christ is the objective reality of revelation. This fierce particularism is central to Barth's position and determines his view of other religions. From the standpoint of the historian, Christianity is another example of human religion. But theologically, God's revelation is the abolition and conclusion of religion. So any religion is disobedience to him and unbelief. The Christian does not need to worry about the relativization of religion through historical scholarship. It cannot touch the individual's faith in Jesus. Humans relativized religion long before the advent of modernity. Thus, Barth approved of Feuerbach's critique of religion as a mere projection of human realities. For Barth, this showed clearly that the truth of Christianity could not be established by any rational or empirical statement. It was only accessible through faith. It was only through the name of Jesus which made Christianity different from other religions. We now come to Berger's critique of Barth. Whilst Barth is unique and brilliant, he also represents a broader intellectual possibility, that of neo-orthodoxy. But his is the most important example of 20th century Christian neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy can be defined as the reaffirmation 
of the objective authority of a religious tradition after a period during which that authority has been relativized and weakened. Because the objective status of the tradition has been questioned, it must be reasserted with great force. The between times after the tradition ceased to be authoritative are too recent to be forgotten. The individual must confront the self certification of the original revelation. If he succeeds in doing that, there's a tremendous cognitive gain. Certainty replaces the period of doubt and compromise. The old cognitive formula of deducing propositions from the tradition is re-employed, hence Berger's term deductivism. Bart's work shows that this is not an arid scholasticism or intellectually unreflexive. Theology for him returns to its original source. Any critique of neo-orthodoxy must begin with the question of how the individual gets into this position in the first place. Bart rejects the question. For him, there was no method for acquiring faith, nor was it mediated through any human experience or action. But this is implausible. No one is born as a theoretician. In Bart's case, the trigger was the shock of 1914, when he lost faith in the liberal elite. Bart also had a method. He followed Kierkegaard in a leap of faith, a method particularly determined by the situation of modernity. Faced with its doubt and despair, the individual becomes a knight of faith and proclaims, yes, I believe. For Kierkegaard, that showed that truth is subjectivity. It is a dialectic between totally unprotected subjectivity and the objective reality as defined by faith. I need to make an aside here just to mention the 19th century Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, uh, often referred to as the father of existentialism, who plays a role in the story. For Kierkegaard, faith was not a matter of regurgitating church dogma, but an individual subjective passion. And for Berger, Kierkegaard is the spectre, the ghost that haunts the Bartian opus. Berger, sorry, Bart admitted that he had been greatly influenced by Kierkegaard in his early thinking, but his thought became increasingly objectivist over time, and the original subjective element was suppressed. He had to suppress it as a cognitive imperative of his method. Whilst neo-orthodoxy asserts that faith is given, its critique asserts that faith is found by certain individuals as a result of empirically available efforts. Bart's own meditations can be embarrassingly pinpointed. It was an effort of the will. Neo-orthodoxy results from the decision to believe again, and as shown in earlier chapters, decisionism is a particular characteristic of modern reflective thought. Can we believe in the objectivity of neo-orthodoxy after its subjective roots and methodological preconditions have been uncovered? We have to ask why someone decides to make a leap of faith in the first place. Kierkegaard's answer to this question was what the Germans called angst, angest in Danish, I gather. Human existence was a welter of anxiety and misery, and the leap of faith was the only way out of despair. This perception of the human condition was at the root of all later existentialism. It makes the leap of faith plausible, but if it is not accepted, the leap is less justified. Individuals have probably always differed in their susceptibility to angst, as Berger puts it. What one man finds tolerable drives another to despair. More significantly, there are social factors. The Kierkegaardian view of the world and its Kierkegaardian solution are determined sociologically. Individual factors are important. Kierkegaard succumbed, but successful Danish bourgeoisie of the time were less likely to. But so is the social context. Germans were more likely to make a leap of faith into neo-orthodoxy neo in the 1930s than in the 1950s. Modernity itself makes decisionism more likely, even for well-adjusted individuals. It becomes easier to find oneself in a world that has become one without certainty. 
But a fuller explanation is needed. Given the reason to leap, which religious tradition is one going to affirm? For Kierkegaard, the Christian option must have seemed like the only one, but Bart at least had to ask about the status of Pure Land Buddhism, which has certain Protestant characteristics. Neo-Orthodoxy assumes that the word of God, or whatever, is uniquely given to a particular religious tradition. Liberal Protestant Protestantism had been greatly troubled by the problem of other religions from the time of Schleimacher onwards. The liberals had tried to show that Christianity was the true, or at least the truest, religion because of its alleged cognitive and moral superiority. But many of these attempts now seem unconvincing, perhaps particularly after European self-destruction in World War I. Were the ethics of Jesus really unique? Unlike the liberals, Bart refused to grapple with this problem. The uniqueness of Christianity for him was a given. Other religions, such as Hinduism, were simply unbelief, a priori, as indeed was Christianity without faith. But as soon as we admit the problem, the a priori objectivity of the neo-Orthodox position begins to collapse, for it is at that moment that it is no longer clear which tradition one is supposed to leap towards. For example, if we translate key passages from Barth's church dogmatics into Muslim or Hindu terms, like Christianity, Islam is proclamatory in its understanding of, reclamation, of revelation. God has predestined who will submit to him and who won't. Affirmation is an act of faith. God speaks. Many people today have access to competing claims to absolute authority, so why should they choose one rather than the other? We can make a leap of faith to any of them. Neo-Orthodoxy claims the destination of this decision to be the starting point, but actually any leap is a human possibility and a human decision. Real individuals make their faith decision in real social contexts and specific individual situations, not in some abstract realm. We all now live in a situation of pluralism, and to, not, to deny that is to deny the reality of our world. Not a good place to begin. So many thanks for listening, and particular thanks to my patrons, Sina Farzell, David Langness, Anthony Lee, Ian Palin, Johannes Rosenbaum, Steve Scholl, Ismail Valesco, Tobias Wetter, Trisha Williams, Jonah Winters, and Gloria Yazdani. You're very welcome to support my channel. Like, comment, and share if you wish. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. And I'll give the Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll finish this chapter uh, with a short section on reflecting on thunder. Uh, have a good day.